to New York to visit this good friend of mine. And just as the plane was landing, I was getting that kind of, you know, fidgety feeling of wanting to check my cell phone. And I was thinking, it wasn't that long ago that when a plane landed, we would all lunge for our cigarette packs. Well, actually, we used to all smoke on the planes. But nowadays, when a plane lands, we all lunge for our cell phones with that same kind of addictive fever, like we can't stand not being connected for a second longer. And it doesn't let up. I'm walking down the street in Manhattan and no one's making eye contact. Everybody's looking down, they're texting, they're tweeting. I half expected to see the Statue of Liberty torch with one hand, texting with the other. So I'm finally at lunch with this really good friend of mine and we are having a fantastic time. I haven't seen her in years. We're laughing, drinking, talking, but I'm still getting this urge to check my email. And I was like, Tiffany, stay focused. You traveled all the way across the United States to see her, stay focused. But eventually it was like, it overtook me. And then I fake needing to go to the bathroom. So I excuse myself, grab my phone, I go into the bathroom stall, kind of hiding, texting, emailing, thinking, what if I become? So I set out to make a film about what it means to be connected in the 21st century. Not only are we connected through ecological systems, but now we've wired the world with so many layers of technology that we've given the world the central nervous system. Something happens in one place and we can see it, feel it, and do something about it, which has such huge potential. But technology has also led to the biggest problems of our day. It's accelerating our connectedness in ways we can't even predict. Take the honeybees. Their recent disappearance is the perfect example of how everything is connected. Albert Einstein predicted that if honeybees were to disappear completely, humanity would be gone in four years. No more honeybees, no more food being pollinated, no more humans. So if one change in our overconnected world can have such far-reaching consequences, how do we use the power of all these connections to turn things around? This was the kind of question I was exploring in this film. And then I had this year that turned my world upside down and forced me to rethink everything I thought I understood about the ways we're connected. Let me back up. When I was growing up, I had my own version of Einstein. I called him dad. He was the one who taught me to look for connections in the first place. He was a general surgeon with a special interest in the brain. And he always found entertaining ways to teach us about his work. When I was in third grade, he came to my class on career day with a huge ice cream container. He put it on the teacher's desk and he started talking about the human brain. He said the way the brain works is very complicated, but a simple way to think about it is that it has two hemispheres. The left brain breaks things down and creates order, and the right brain recognizes patterns and processes emotions. And he talked about how the two hemispheres have to work together. And then at the end of his lesson, he opened up the ice cream carton and there was this real human brain in formaldehyde. Everybody freaked out. And then he took us all out for ice cream. In addition to being a surgeon, my father also wrote best-selling books that drew links between disparate fields. He searched for patterns throughout history to give insight into why we do what we do. In his first book, he drew parallels between breakthroughs in art and breakthroughs in science. 
And you know, the artist expresses the nature of reality using image and metaphor. And the physicist is investigating the nature of reality and expresses it using numbers and equations. But it's the same thing, they're just different languages. Like how cubism challenged viewers' notions of space and time, right before Einstein published his theories about space and time. Or how the artist Seurat started painting using tiny dots right around the same time that scientists theorized molecules. He found examples like this throughout history. His books influenced a lot of people. Sometimes he was criticized for not being an expert in the fields he wrote about, but I think it was his outsider perspective that allowed him to see these bigger connections. So when I started researching all these connections and how we could use them to help solve our problems, it was natural to ask him to be one of the co-writers. Especially since he and my mom pretty much co-wrote my brain. And I definitely needed help. Just look at my first notes. I spent weeks staring at this picture, wondering where to even begin. Everything is so intertwined. And I thought, maybe part of the problem is that we try to deal with all of these issues in isolation. Why did we start doing that? So I turned to my father for some perspective. He said, go to the past and look for patterns. Pretend you're an alien looking at this unusual species called humans. So I did. I hired a narrator to help give that omniscient vibe, and I went way back. <clears throat> Once upon a time, a single point exploded into the universe. For a time, dinosaurs lived large. Then, not so much. One theory of why they died out is that they couldn't adapt to the new flowering plants that depended on bees for pollination. Bad news for the dinosaurs. Good news for the bees. Then a new group of very adaptable mammals emerged. They were social, lovable creatures whose brains grew rapidly in early evolution. Not so that they could use tools or expand their thinking, but because of their need to connect with each other. These large brains are what distinguished humans from the other two million species on Earth. Yet for eons, they weren't really able to progress because they had no way to record information. <gasps> then they finally invented a radical new technology that would change their lives forever. The alphabet made it easier to accumulate knowledge which allowed humans to progress and multiply. But literacy also led to something unexpected. In the alphabet versus the goddess, Leonard Schlein points to how literacy changed the way humans think. When the alphabet was introduced into society, it overstimulated the analytic left hemisphere of the brain. He builds on the theory that the left hemisphere, which is used in reading and writing, is associated with masculine traits, and that the right hemisphere, used to see images and patterns, is more feminine. So Schlein suggests that the advent of literacy shifted the balance of power between men and women. While in most ancient societies, men worshiped goddesses, whenever literacy was introduced into a society, a new patriarchal outlook emerged. 
He traced this pattern throughout history, finding links between the onset of literacy and the oppression of women around the world. Maybe there's a way to build on my father's ideas about literacy and patriarchy. If he's saying that the invention of writing shifted us to a more analytical left brain mode of thinking, maybe the shift also led to our tendency to think of world problems in isolation. 